All right, well, to kick it off this evening, we have Dean on our forum. So welcome, everybody. Um, Dean is uh, going to talk a bit about uh, computer software and ham radio stuff. So, Dean, are you ready to go? I am as ready as I will ever be. Excellent. Go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me get my uh, screen shared here. We're going to actually talk about computer programming for ham radio, um, which is a topic near and dear to my heart. And um, it's going to lead into several other topics that we're going to discuss at upcoming meetings and um, that uh, maybe, maybe have something to do with our maker, uh, um, emerging maker community. Um, and uh, today's discussion is really just a very lightweight intro discussion. So you don't need to take any notes. I'm not going to be teaching you how to write any software, but I am going to talk to a little bit about what this, what this whole area of computer software and ham radio is and uh, why we should be interested in it. This came up because of a conversation I had with Howard um, on the two meter net one, one day. And he was asking, uh, he says, you know, you've been in software for a while and I want to, I want to do some software, but uh, I'm not sure what should I, there's so many choices. What should I be, what, what do I want to do? You know, do I need to study Perl or Python or Java or JavaScript, or do I need to do, uh, you know, basic or, you know, I did some programming back in, uh, in industry, but it's been a long time. And I, you know, where, where, where do I start and what do I do? And I thought, well, what a really good topic because that, that kind of gets into, well, what are all these programming languages and what are they good for? And why are there so many of them? And uh, what, what ones should we be interested in? And so what we're going to talk about tonight is the basic idea of what's a programming language anyway, and why do we have them, and what do they do? And then we're going to look at a few in a little bit of detail that are of use to uh, us as amateur radio operators. And we'll talk a little bit about what you can do with those sorts of things um, if, you, uh, if, you, uh, if you dive in. So a little bit about me. Um, and why am I qualified to tell you all this? Well, for about 40 years, uh, I have been a software developer and a software technology executive and a manager. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But I, I know a little bit about this business. I've been doing it for a long, long time. I'm not an expert in every aspect of it, but I've done enough that I can... Uh, I can kind of talk uh, reasonably about just about anything you want to talk about. If it, if it has to do with computers and software, I pretty much have been there and done that at least in some way or the other, or I've managed other people who have been there and done that and had to, and had to deal with them. So that's my, uh, that's kind of my professional cred here. Uh, unlike my uh, lack of professional cred as an uh, electrical engineer, I have a lot of credibility in this particular topic area and, and um, I'm comfortable with what I know and um, I'm also comfortable with what I don't know, which is a big chunk of being able to do this stuff well as understanding what you know and what you don't know. So that's me and that's what we're gonna talk about here for the next 30 minutes or so and I'll make sure we leave some time for questions. So the Encyclopedia Britannica, everyone remember those? We actually still have one downstairs. It says a computer programming language uh, is a language for uh, expressing detailed instructions for a digital computer. That sounds pretty straightforward. How do you tell a computer what to do? Well, you have to express it in some sort of language and that language usually comes in structure and they have all kinds of different names and they have all kinds of different structures of the syntax. But at the end of the day, they just are sets of instructions for telling a computer what to do. It could be as high level as open a file on the disk, read it in a memory, display it on the screen, or as low level as, you know, wait 250 microseconds for some event to happen and then trigger a, um, uh, trigger a relay or trigger a controller or um, something like that if you were doing like an embedded real-time system for, uh, for a robot or, or something like that. Um, but basically, the program is what takes this piece of um, digital, this, this piece of electronics, which is a set of circuits that by itself does nothing and turns it into an infinite number of virtual machines. Every program essentially implements a machine on top of a CPU, on top of a, on top of a computer, and that program combined, that software combined with the hardware makes a unique machine. 
And there are an infinite number of these machines that can be created because there's an infinite number of ways you can construct logic to manipulate a digital computer. And they can be small and they can be big and they can be the, uh, they can be as small as, all right, we're, we're all about of an age here. So almost everybody here had a VCR at one time, right? And you had to program the front end of that VCR. Well, all you were doing is you were programming a microcontroller that some other programmer had written a control program to allow you to inter interact with. Or if you have a sprinkler controller, that's got a that's got a microcontroller in it, and you program that to run your sprinklers at certain times of the day, or your microwave oven, or nowadays your just about everything in your house has some sort of a microcomputer control. Those are all controlled by software. And those are all written in these programming languages, some of which we're gonna talk about tonight. There are lots of programming languages. Um, Britannica says relatively few are wide, widely used today. I think that's a very dated uh, um, um, uh, observation. There are many, many languages that are in use today depending on the purpose for which you're using them. But for hams, it is mostly true. There's only a handful of languages that we're really interested in because of the kind of things that we want to do. So why should hams learn to program? Well, I mean, the first idea here is that uh, amateur radio has a rich tra uh, tradition of experimentation and of building things yourself, right? And if, if you can't get it commercially, um, you know, the ham's natural instinct is, well, maybe I can build it. And, you know, we heard uh, in the pre-meeting folks talking about old Heathkit um, uh, tube uh, kits that they built uh, and listened to shortwave uh, listening. And uh, uh, we still have a very large component of our club that um, builds radios, works on radios, extends radios, fixes radios, um, everything from, uh, you know, uh, uh, 60 year old plus um, uh, boat anchors to the very modern uh, microcomputer controlled um, uh, with integrated circuits and computers. And we have, we have all of those folks in the club that are dealing with that. And so this rich uh, uh, tradition of experimentation um, directly um, uh, is related to the ability to do software. Because remember what I said, if you combine software with a piece of hardware, a CPU, you can create an infinite number of machines. Virtually anything you can imagine that can be done, you know, with a set of logic and a set of switches and inputs and outputs can be done with a computer as we know from our, from our everyday life. So it is the ultimate ham radio homebrew tool is software because with software, if you don't like the way your radio works, you don't have to get out your soldering iron. You just have to think about it, translate it to logic, and write it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what kind of things can you do? Well, you can obviously build a web page, right? We all, we all use web pages. And if you want your web page to be more than the static junk that, the, say, QRZ gives you, you learn a language called HTML or some other things like that, and you can make your web page come alive. You can link it up to, say, the... the uh, um, uh, solar cycle uh, um, monitoring, or you can keep an active log on your QRZ page, or you can do any number of things that you might want to do uh, with, with, uh, with your web page. Obviously, you can configure your Raspberry Pi, which might have your FT8 software running on it, but you want it to run certain things at certain times. You want to write, you want to, you want to, you want to broadcast a Beacon every 60 minutes with your call sign, like for your repeater, you can do that with your Raspberry Pi. You want to, uh, you want to uh, 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 put your repeater into, um, into uh, net mode. You can do that with a script, uh, uh, which is a piece of software that runs on the Raspberry Pi. Obviously, if you're a home brewer and you want to build your own stuff, there's an infinite number of things you can build, just a few of them there, VFOs and signal generators, Morse coders, decoders, frequency counters, oscilloscopes. Um, and across that list, almost all of them have a very similar uh, common hardware platform. The thing that differentiates them is the software. And of course, modern software-defined radios, the, there's that S word again, software-defined radios. A part of the radio that used to run in hardware now runs in software, and that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we go. Um, um, many software-defined radios now 
uh, uh, take the input almost from the antenna and digitize it uh, and the rest of the processing, the filtering and all that sort of thing is done in software. So if you want a new filter, you don't go buy a crystal filter and solder it up, you program a filter digitally to do the digital filtering. And that is a set of, uh, a, a, a whole new set of tools that we have available to us that we, that we didn't have before. And of course these, these uh, radios are also very flexible and customizable. And sometimes they have their own programming language like Flex built into it in their own API or application programming interface. So you can write your own code to make the thing do something different than the manufacturer had in mind. So this is very much a ham radio, amateur radio tradition. Uh, you can have it your way. You don't like the way it works, tear it apart and do it your own way. So that's that's kind of the, the the, the call for why you might want to learn to do some, uh, some software programming. Um, but which programs to use? This was Howard's question. Well, um, I have now revealed the super secret handshake of the uh, Computer Programmers Guild, um, and I'm probably going to get expelled. But here's the dirty little secret. All computer languages are essentially the same you can write virtually any program in virtually any language. It might take you more work. Some things are going to make it easier. Some things are going to make it harder. I just have a list of, uh, I, I printed out the, the first program anybody ever writes when you go to, when you, when you, when you learn to program is something called hello world because it's short and it just gets the computer to talk back to you. Print hello world and you say run and it says hello world. Or if you're uh, or if you're a narcissist, you say, print, hello, Dean, I'm here to serve you. And then the computer tells you that. So you can see there's a bunch of different languages. Uh, you can write a hello world in any language, and they will all do exactly the same thing. They will, ex they will put out in some way, shape, or form, hello world. You could write one that says, hello world in Morse code, and it'll put up the dits and das. You could write one that uh, does it in any, ver any way you want it. But at the end of the day, you could write any of those programs in virtually any language. It's just a matter of understanding what they can do and what they can't do. So um, the uh, computer architectures that we run today, by and large, were created by a couple of guys uh, uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, uh, John van Neumann created the architecture, the technical, physical architecture by which we run computers, which is where you have some 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 durable memory where things are stored. You have an operating CPU that pulls instructions from memory and data from memory and puts it back in there. That's a von Neumann architecture machine. And it has been um, uh, proven, uh, academically proven, that any von Neumann architecture machine is identical to any other von Neumann architecture machine and what they can do and what they cannot do. They can all be programmed to do all the same things because they are essentially built on the same architecture. With software, virtually all of the software that we write today derives from Alan Turing. You remember Turing, the Turing machine, the guy that, uh, that uh, uh, figured out how to decode the, the, um, uh, the German uh, codes uh, in World War II at Bletchley Park? Well, he created the model, the, the, the um, uh, model for all future programming languages and how, how programming would work. This idea that you can create, you can take a series of instructions and run them in a sequence and cause the computer to change its state in a way that does something meaningful. So all computers are based on von Neumann architecture and all software is derived from the this classical Turing machine that, uh, that Alan Turing envisioned in his head. He never built one, he just described it, and he described it perfectly in a way that derives the rest of, of computer science from that. So big idea here is you wanna pick your programming language for the thing that makes it easiest to do what you wanna do and not because somebody told you you should go learn Perl or JavaScript or Fortran, right? Yeah, you, it, it, it doesn't really matter. And at the end of the day, if you become good at one of these, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, and in my case, the 9,000th one, will all be the same. Because they all do the same thing and there's a way to do it. You just have to kind of noodle through and figure out what that way to do it is. So that's, that's uh, Howard, that answers one of your questions. It doesn't matter, but now I'm gonna tell you, well, it kind of does. So there are some things where, where it's gonna make a difference. So we're gonna pick, I'm gonna pick one of the languages that is useful for uh, general purpose programming, it's called Perl. 
Perl is what's called a scripting language, meaning it runs uh, on a, a system without the need of additional um, tools like a compiler, which would take text and turn it into a computer code. You basically type your program into uh, uh, the Perl engine and Perl executes it directly. There's no, there are no intermediate steps that you have to go through. Um, it can, um, uh, you could code anything in Perl from very quick scripts. And when I say about scripts, I th I'm thinking of things like I talked about earlier. Let's say you want a, um, uh, a utility that runs a program every, uh, uh, some of the, say you set it up, you want something that runs every 30 minutes and you want it to go get a weather report and transmit that weather report on your repeater. That you can do in a script and you do that in Perl and you write it, it's just like writing in English, you use a regular word processor type of, of, of uh, tool to write it and then you set it up and it executes. These, uh, Perl was mostly used in the Unix world and by Unix I also mean Linux and by Linux I mean Raspberry Pi. Uh, because that's the thing that um, many of us are using right now. And a Raspberry Pi is just a little computer. It's a tiny little computer on a board uh, that uh, runs a version of the Unix operating system, and it can do virtually anything that any Unix computer can do. So um, Perl is a scripting language. It allows you to configure things. Um, there's a, I did a quick search on the Internet for hams who've made use of, uh, of Perl. I thought this was an interesting one. Uh, you can you can use this uh, ham scrape program to go find uh, references to your call sign on qrz.com, for example, right? And so that's the kind of thing you can do with Perl. It's old. It was created in the mid 1980s by a guy named Larry Wall at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I worked with Larry briefly. I, I don't. I doubt if he remembers me because he's a bit older than me and we overlap just a little bit. And then when he wrote Perl, he was at the Computer Data Corporation. So, so um, Perl is a good scripting language. If you want to configure your Raspberry Pi, if you want to configure, uh, if you're running a repeater controller, Brennan, and you want to know how to do that, those are the kind of things, that's the kind of programming language you would want to le learn for doing that sort of thing. So that's Perl. Uh, Python's another one you'll hear about a lot. Uh, uh, Python has a reputation of being easy to learn, easy to read, easy to maintain. I've written a little bit of Python code. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's not necessarily the most intuitive thing. Um, one of the benefits of Python is it's cr cross-platform. You install the Python engine on any computer, and you can run Python code, and it's generally transportable. If you write it once, you can generally run it on different platforms. So this gets you around having to say, well, I need a PC version, a Mac version, a Linux version. You just write a Python version, and you run that Python version in each of the different uh, in each of the different uh, um, uh, 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 environments. And um, there's a again an infinite number. Of, uh, of ham uses for it. Um, it also uh, was created in the late 80s, so it's another older language, but it has evolved and is uh, one of the languages of artificial intelligence today. So data scientists learn Python in school, and uh, they almost all program in Python when they come out of school because it's very convenient to connect to all kinds of other languages. And as I said, since it runs on every single platform, you don't need to worry about, well, which cloud am I on today and which thing am I on today? I, I just write my Python script and I package it up and I can use it in different places. Um, one really interesting application of Python that we've seen recently at club meetings is this idea of nano VNA. The nano VNA is a little hardware device that, um, that uh, is a vector network analyzer. You can use it for uh, doing uh, antenna SWR uh, measurements. You can look at, uh, you can characterize filters with it. There's all kinds of things you can do with it. Well, some ham has written a software application for it that runs in Python, that runs on your PC or your Mac or your Raspberry Pi called Nano VNA Saver. And you can see it's a pretty rich, complex application. And that's all written in Python and uh, maintained in Python. And by the way, it's open source. So if you want a copy of the computer program code, it's like getting a schematic for your radio. It's all there and you can take it. And if you don't like his version of Nano VNA Saver, you make your own. You can change it, you can do whatever you want with it because it's open source and it's free. And there are, I wanna say thousands of things like this out there and many, many, many applications for amateur radio. So that's Python.
So Python's another one of the one of the programming language that might be of interest to you if you want to do programming for ham radio. Another one you're going to hear a lot about is JavaScript. Well, JavaScript is the language of the internet. It's how web pages do all those things that annoy you. All the things like pop-up ads and, and uh, you know, store your cookies and uh, come back to you and say, you haven't changed your password in nine hours. Please change your password again. All that stuff, that's all done in JavaScript. And JavaScript is another scripting language. It runs inside your browser. So it runs as part of your internet browser, and it is usually deployed as part of a website. So when you're building your websites and you want them to do things, you build JavaScript into your web pages, and that's how you get your web pages to do stuff. At the, in the very early days of the internet, and I'm talking about the early 90s, say, um, web pages were static. They, you clicked on a link, it brought you another link. The whole idea of a hypertext transfer protocol was you wanted to link stuff together so you could just click on stuff and link it. But there were no what we would call applications on the internet at the, in those days because there was no way to interact with the user. There was no way to put up buttons and pull down lists and change the behavior of the website based on a user's in, input. So JavaScript was one of the ways that um, the technologies that got created to help us make web pages come alive and, and operate. So that's JavaScript, and if you want to become a, a master web programmer and do cool things with, with your website, you want to learn JavaScript because that's how you embed your, your uh, logic and programs into, into your website and get them to do really, really interesting things. Next one I want to talk about is the one that, um, for homebrewers, is... Um, one of the most important, and that is this C language or C and C++. And uh, why are there two? Well, C came first, and it was the language that was used to create the Unix operating system. And uh, it goes back to the late 60s and the early 70s. A guy named Dennis Ritchie um, uh, created the language C. Um, fun fact, uh, there was a predecessor language known as B. I don't know if there was ever an A, I suspect there was, but I know there's a B and then there was a C. And then, um, and then when they decided, when this idea of object-oriented programming came along, which I'm not gonna go into right now because that's a whole other lecture, uh, and they wanted to add object orientation to C, the first name of the new programming language was C with objects. But they decided that was kind of an awkward and funny name, so they called it C++ because uh, one of the things about C is it's cryptic and hard to read and has a weird syntax. And doesn't those other languages that I talked about that read like English, C doesn't read like English. You have to work hard to make C readable because it was written by a bunch of computer geeks for a bunch of other computer geeks so they could create operating systems like, like Unix. And to give you an idea of the, the way these guys think, they wrote programs called GREP, General Regular Expression, parser, grep, and lex, which was a lexical analyzer. And then they wrote one called a yak, which is yet another compiler compiler. So this is the way Unix geeks think, and this is the way they thought all the time. And so if you decide to dive into C programming, you get a little bit of a learning curve. But there's good news there too, because this is all for the language of microcontrollers uh, and the language of the Arduino. So the Arduino is a is a uh, microcontroller, an MCU, and what you see in front of you, uh, that little blue board is the Arduino microcontroller, and the actual uh, computer chip itself is the little black square right in the middle with all the pins coming out, little surface mount chip, that's the actual computer. Unless smaller than probably your pinky fingernail, pretty small, um, but it's a full-blown computer. It has memory, uh, it has the ability to execute programs sequentially. It has input and output ports, so you can do things like read from a digital encoder. That's the that's the knob you see there that looks like a potentiometer. You can write to a uh, a display like the um, that's a, a Nexteon touchscreen display. All that is programmable from that little bitty board called the the uh, uh, Arduino Nano. And you can buy clone Arduino Nanos for, wait for it, three bucks, $3 for um, 
this full-fledged microcontroller um, uh, that is fully programmable, and it can do things like create the entire control system for your homebrew rig like I built, or, uh, which you see right in front of you. Or you can um, uh, do a, a signal analyzer with it, or you can uh, do a signal generator with it, or an S meter, or an SWR meter, or a, and it's not hard once you kind of get over the learning curve. So I want to show you right now what you can do after 40 years and one hour, okay? So this is the um, one hour SWR meter. S meter. All right, so that's a, that's an S meter that I built for my homebrew um, uh, 40 meter transceiver. And it literally took me an hour to, to build that. Um, it's <laughs> the Arduino and the display and one resistor and then a tap point for the, um, on the AGC for the limiter circuit. Uh, and then some software to measure the voltage and translate it into uh, an S meter. I wrote it in an hour, so 40 years in an hour, uh, and you can write, um, you can create your, you can create your own S meter. And just to give you an idea of, wait a minute, how simple the code is, that's all the software. That 40 lines of text is all of the software. And at another time, I will walk you through this and show you how simple it really, really is. But just to give you an idea, you look over on the left, kind of halfway down, it says LCD set cursor zero zero. Well, that LCD is the is the screen, and it's two lines high by 16 characters wide. And all I'm saying is put the cursor up at the upper left in the first position so I can start drawing on it. And then things like LCD print. Remember hello world? I could have done LCD print hello world. Well, so I'm printing out uh, the values. And then in the main program on the right-hand side, it's a loop, which just means it repeats over and over again. And um, you can ignore kind of the, the, the stuff right at the top, but um, the key parts of it are uh, about a third of the way down. It says S meter raw equals analog read S meter pin. So I'm telling the Arduino, go get me the value of this pin that I have connected to my radio and tell me what the voltage is on that pin. And the voltage comes in and then I have a little uh, loop there that converts that voltage into something to put on the display. And then at the very bottom, it says delay 500. That means wait 500 milliseconds and do it again. So twice a second, it's gonna update the display. That's it. That's the entire code. Once you learn a few basics about how to plug in an Arduino, uh, how to bring up the uh, environment and what you can do with it. And I think you can see from there that it's not hard to imagine going from that to something much more complex like that than the, like, uh, the thing I showed uh, up here, this, uh, uh, this display here. Uh, same, same microcontroller, same code, different display. Obviously, a lot more code because I've got a lot of different things on there. I've got VFOA and VFOB and split mode and tune controls and scanning controls and S meters, but it's essentially an extension of what I just did there. And every piece of it is about the same size as the thing you just saw. So, you know, you combine all those things together, and it's like, all right, well, this uh, radio controller is what I would call 40 years at a weekend took me a weekend to write once I kind of figured out what I wanted what I wanted to do. So that's what you can do with computer software for ham radio. Those are some of the programming languages that you can use and some of the environments. And coming up in uh, two weeks, um, uh, the presentation at that point, I'm going to do a longer presentation 
and I'm going to take a project simpler than this, and we're going to build it from scratch and let you see what it takes to actually build one of these things and make it work. And given the beauty of Zoom and the fact that I can share my screen with you, I can show you what the computer development environment is. I can show you what the components look like. I can show you how that all works. And this is the kind of thing that is going to help, you know, if you're interested in getting involved in this, um, this is the kind of thing that will help you do that. And so that is it. There's some references at the back. I'll make sure that the slides get up. And um, with that, I'm happy to take uh, questions if we have some time. Hey, Dean. Yes. So what about the uh, PIC processors? And uh, <laughs> there's been a lot of, um, you know, there was a lot of stuff about trying to use right source code for running things on PIC microprocessors. So, so the PICs have largely been eclipsed by the Arduinos because the Arduino is open source and it comes with a full development environment. And um, so what's happened is the uh, maker community, not just the ham radio community, but the maker community has um, adopted um, the Arduinos as this kind of standard. And there are all kinds of varieties of them. The one I just showed you is a small kind of lightweight one, but they go up to full blown 32 bit uh, computers with floating point and all kinds of things in them. Uh, all in that same kind of packaging, all programmable from the same interface. And they made it easy to plug in stuff. So you can still get picks. Pick, a pick is just another microcontroller and you can get a programming environment for them. But uh, those have largely, uh, in my mind, been eclipsed by the Arduino platform just because it's so straightforward and easy to use. There is a funny story I read about why, PIC, uh, why AVR has been picked for uh, uh, Arduino. And actually, it, it shows the power of open source. The, the developers of Arduino, were when they were uh, trying to figure out which processor to use, approached uh, uh, microchip uh, about their development environment, uh, Atmel, they looked around and uh, uh, micro, microchip said, okay, we'll, we, we'll charge money for, the, for development tools. They said, okay. Uh, it turned out that uh, AV, uh, tools for AVR were already, uh, already available as open source, they, so they picked it so it was av easily available for everybody. People didn't have to pay for it. And that's how the, how it, uh, Arduino became a, an, an AVR thing, and that's how it became so popular. And and um, the fact that they open sourced the hardware design for the boards means that anybody can manufacture the boards, and that's why you can buy Arduino Nano clones from China for three dollars. Right? I might add, Dean. I might add, Jessica and, and Dean. Um, a few years ago, I did, a, I did a presentation on doing a DDS oscillator that was controlled by a PICX, which basically is a, it's a, it's a PIC chip, but written with some code where you actually, instead of writing it in machine code, you write it in uh, reduced instruction set basic. Right. But uh, it never really took off. Uh, and I, haven't, I haven't played with the thing in years. I'm thinking about, I really am thinking about getting back into building an oscillator again, but I want to build it with Arduinos instead. And I, and I just sent you a question by text. If you have like a special, uh, if you had anything like a special library for that fancy presentation you done C++, because I kind of want to do something like that with a, with a screen, uh, either with a either with a Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, that one right there. That one right there, because I want to do something like that. I'm using I'm using the um, uh, FL 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 rig or FL Digi on the. Uh, FT817 with, with a seven inch monitor so I can actually read this, the screen. Right. But what I'd like to do is actually have a self-contained one, like what you've got there driving the cat. Yep, so what you see there actually has cat control built into it. So I've actually programmed the cat control uh, library into that as well. So that's eminently doable. Um, and in fact, I am documenting this particular build gradually on my blog. I haven't updated it lately, but I've got a few, I've got, I've made some progress since the last time I updated it and um, I'm documenting each each uh, aspect of it and I'm making the source code available on GitHub. For those of you that don't know what GitHub is, it's the computer programmers um, 
uh, open source repository. So you create a GitHub library and you publish your stuff up there and other people can contribute and other people can get it, uh, get it freely. So I'm putting my code as I get it ready up on GitHub so it's available for use. And I'll, at the right time, I'll publish the links to that so that people can get it. Dean, thank you. Because I really would like to see that code. Yeah. Because I, I do know something about C and C++. I haven't used it much in years. And I really haven't played that with Arduino much, but it doesn't well, what, look that hard. What you'll find is that um, there's a huge amount of uh, tutorial material available on the internet. Um, uh, I started with a simple program just to turn the LED on the nano on and off. And I was like, okay, the light's flashing on and off. And that's the equivalent of hello world for the nano is you make that LED turn on and off. And then you just kind of gradually build from that. Um, there's a huge user community of people that, um, that do this stuff. On the last page here, let me go back to that. Um, you'll see that I referenced uh, a guy named Jack Purdom, W-A-T-E-E. -E. Well, Jack is a ham. Uh, he's very active in the Ubitix community, um, uh, Microbitix community. Uh, and uh, he's uh, 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 of a similar age, but he's been a college professor most of that time. He, teach, he taught software engineering uh, and computer programming, and he's written a series of books uh, from ARL. This brand new one just came out this week, Microcontroller Projects for Amateur Radio. So if you get one of his books, get that one, because it's going to be the most up-to-date with the latest uh, information about the latest hardware and, uh, and so on. And just a basic book on C is his other book, Beginning C for Microcontrollers. It would be good if you're going to do this to have a reference or two at hand that you can you can uh, look at. I will be honest with you, even after doing this for 40 years, I still look stuff up. I, I forget. I, I, I know you can do a thing, but I forget how to do it, so I have to go look it up and find an example of it. And there's lots of examples. That's the, that's one of the uh, great things about it. Thank you for bringing up Ubix, by the way. I do have one. I haven't built it yet. Uh, oh, build it. Anyway, guys, thanks. Build it. You're going to like it. Yeah, by the way, th thanks to Con Tom, W7SUA on that one, because he helped me find it. Right. <laughs> so, all right, uh, unless there's any other uh, questions. Thank you so much, Dean. Uh, excellent presentation. Cheers. Forward to the follow -up. Yes, look forward to the follow-up next week, or in two weeks. Two, two weeks. weeks. Should be a lot of fun. Um, been impressed with all the stuff you've been doing, so it's really cool.